Because we're going to stay on agenda. Uh, we stay on. Three. We're going to. That's depends, our goal. If, if anybody blows it out of the water, it'll be me with the budget discussion. So, okay. or how many questions you have? We won't have any. Ashley, a girl can bring. Uh, it's been a long week. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it has. I second that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Six oh two. Are we ready to? Okay. So I'm going to call the meeting to, to order. Um, and uh, we have uh, an adjustment to the agenda um, that I'm going to ask Lane to just uh, tell us a little bit about. It's so I had this is a uh, had two kind of late requests to access. Um, funds from the reserve accounts um, for two primary purposes. Um, the first one is for $67,500. Um, and that is to replace two trucks, one of which is non-functional right now. The other, um, and this is for facilities uh, used for snow plowing. The other that the transmission has just dropped and the cost of replacing it isn't worth uh, the cost. Um, and so that one would actually come from the transportation reserve fund. And then, so I apologize for that. The other one that we have is kind of neat and it goes along with some of the work that we're planning and, and trying to get done um, over the next year or so. And they're trying to build an outdoor classroom space at Randolph Elementary. Um, they have actually secured a small grant, about three or $4,000 to assist in this. Um, but the grant has a time window on it and the window's gonna run out pretty soon. Um, and so they're asking for the additional funding required um, to be able to make that happen, which is about $13,700. Um, we do have a, uh, as, as part of the big kind of recovery plan that we built, um, this is one of the goals of that recovery plan is to set up those outdoor classrooms at the elementary levels. Eventually there will be one at all three schools. Um, and we do have a curriculum specialist in, in, uh, in, in outdoor lessons um, in Harriet. So um, I think it's a, it's a good investment. So those are the two things that, that we're looking for tonight is board's approval um, to take that money from those reserve funds for those purposes. So what I need the board to do is uh, just uh, approve an amend or a, a change to the agenda and to add that approval to the consent agenda. For our meeting. So moved. Second. Any questions? Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, so we're moving that, uh, the uh, spending of reserve funds, I guess, to the consent agenda. Okay, um, so tonight we're going to just spend a little bit of time um, just reviewing monitoring and the purpose of monitoring. We're going to also spend some time uh, seeing where Lane is in his development of the budget. And we're going to uh, spend a little bit of time talking about uh, our linkage with our ownership in terms of the uh, uh, report for voters at the annual meeting. Um, so that's sort of the focus of this meeting tonight. Um, are there any questions? Okay, uh, so the other thing that we need for t to get started is a meeting evaluator. Do we have a volunteer? Oh, I'm on it. Okay. Mm -hmm. That will be good. Uh, I do. Need a I do. Okay. So the um, before we start public comment, um, I wanted to just. Uh, and I had Linda bring these two brochures to the meeting tonight um, just because I had gotten a message um, from a community member just 
confused about what the rules were and um, around how we're managing public comment. Um, and so I was just looking around and I found um, that in this brochure and also um, on our website under our required policies, we do have sort of a stated um, section. So if you look in the, in the one brochure that says understanding the mission, work, and procedures of the OSA uh, school, blah, blah, blah. Um, if you look in under, under the third panel on the right, um, there's a section there that sort of outlines how we're supposed to manage the um, public comment. So if you see there, um, it says, uh, we set aside public comment time at the beginning of each scheduled meeting. In some cases, a time limit may be placed on how long or many times a participant may speak on a particular issue. In addition, the chair will ask for comments on agenda items before action is taken by the board. Um, that was something that I hadn't been doing and, and hadn't realized that we actually had a procedure on that. Um, so I would appreciate board members keeping me um, on track to make sure that I'm doing things as I'm supposed to as the chair. Um, and then I'm um, just reading a little bit further down. Every effort will be made to hear all comments appropriate to an issue. Uh, but the chair may rule out of order comments that breach privacy of, of students, parents, or school employees, or that do not comply with board policies on complaints. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to bring everybody's attention to the brochure so that we all sort of are familiar with them. And if you know we feel like they're no longer appropriate, we may want to make some changes to them. But um, for now, these are the procedures that we have. Um, so with that review, um, I'm going to open up the meeting to any public comment. And uh, I also want to recognize that I did, uh, I had that one public comment was an email. That's why I, I was researching this um, uh, from, uh, and that was from Nora Skolnick. And then we also had an email that, thank you, Brian, for pointing it out to me because for whatever reason, it, it is not, it did not come to my email. It's because okay. I responded to that email and it went to you. That and it time. went to me, which yeah. is so bizarre. Yeah, because I checked my trash, I checked my spam, and I had no uh, no email there. But anyway, we had uh, an email question to the board um, regarding the uh, attendance protocols for major sports. That I, that I responded to. Um, and so those are the recognition of our, of our electronic public comments. Did any, anybody else have any? And I don't know if at some point we want to add maybe something about how we want to respond when it's an electronic. When we do the public comment in the meetings, we don't respond to the person. But when I get a, when I get an email, I often respond. So, so Ms. Ann, that, this is Matt Fordham, and, and I'm the one who sent in, obviously, the, the email last week re regarding the, the uh, athletics. And I don't know if, if now is an appropriate time to speak up, but I know by the time I heard back from you and I had drafted an email back, it was too late to get anything on the agenda, obviously. Matt, if I um, could just stop you right there, just because I want to answer uh, Anne's kind of more general question about sure. whether we should have policy on electronic uh, comments. If someone writes to just one of the board, they're not necessarily meaning it to be a public comment. Or are they? I, I, I don't know if we can determine I mean, I, th that. I think that's maybe something we might want to think about. 
right. for our procedures is how do we want to manage email communication from community members right because our emails are up there but right. if they choose to do that rather than right public comment it is that a you know right and how do we want to manage that I, mm -hmm. I think that's important for the board to, to think about and, yes. and come up with some procedures for that Okay, sorry, Matt. You, you wanna? Oh no worries. And and as a person who 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 typed in, I don't know how many emails to get it to you all. It, it would be awesome if there was a group email for that would address the entire board. So that would you know one click goes to all all OSSD board members. That would be very helpful because at any one point you could type one of those characters wrong. Um, so I, I did inquire about the uh, the sports attendance and, and uh, Mr. Millington. I did re read your email which I've, you know, I, I appreciate the fact that you took uh, into consideration other schools in the, in the, whether it was in the, in the local area or within, within the leagues, I'm, I'm not clear, you know, necessarily which one, it doesn't matter. So I do appreciate you guys getting together and trying to find some common approach to it. And I do appreciate the fact that we're leaning towards allowing the spectators um, as a, as a parent, right. Of an athlete who had to miss last year um, winter sports, watching our child, it, it's, it's not fun. It's not uh, a great way to interact with our kids and our kids aren't seeing our support in that way. It's very challenging to, to, uh, to be there for your kid when you're not allowed to be. And while I appreciate the, the uh, environment that we were in last year, it would seem like everybody is, is you know, not everybody, but, but most people are in Vermont, are following the protocols, are following the vaccination guidelines, are, are doing what they need to do. And Mr. Millington, you and I have had discussions in the past about the liability to the school, and I understand that the school is not protected, so I can also appreciate that. But in, in, I, in your response to my question, um, you, you uh, communicated that the board has chosen to delegate all decisions in this area to the superintendent. And while I can respect that decision, I would also ask that um, as the as the board that you also take in consideration the parents perspectives and, and needs to to be involved in their kids and especially when it comes to uh, some of the things that we are all allowed to participate in like the sports it, it's crucial that we're there it's crucial that we're part of our kids lives and missing out that on second year is is just not you know an option i would think uh, for our students and for our parents as a coach um, i know that parents can be difficult during these times as well so I can appreciate there's one or two parents that may may pose challenges. And Mr. Millington, when I read your email, I felt more threatened, honestly, than anything, because it seemed like if there was one one action, then that's going to affect all parents and all students. And I don't think that's the, the appropriate approach um, as as a you know part of the school, as a parent, as part of the Boosters Club that's just getting kicked off again. If there's anything we can do to support the safety of these events. We will volunteer to do so if it's taking temperatures as they come in if it's reminding people to wear masks if it's handing out masks as they come into the events we want to be there to help i know schools are, are stretched thin and resources are thin but let us help before a unilateral decision is made to just block parents from being a part of our kids lives at these events um, we want to help we want to take take part in in whatever we can do please let us do that before some rash decisions being made and and on the second part, you know, I know there's stuff happening in the state. One of them substantiated a soccer game. The other one's still being investigated. Um, you know, I, I hope our fans aren't the behaviors that we've witnessed or, or alleged you know, witnessed uh, by other folks. And um, I'd like to believe our fans are, 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 are not in that, uh, that mode. But again, you know, the email was very threatening to say, hey, if we have an instance of this, we very well may do X, Y, and Z. So... So please don't let one or two um, community members that may or may not follow what we, you know, the intent of all the goodwill parents are trying to do uh, affect those trying to be involved in our in our kids' lives. And 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 please, when we can, let the parents help. Thank you for sharing your thoughts, Matt. Appreciate it. Are there any other public 
again with this public comment remember that we listen but we're not we're not it's not we're not engaging in a dialogue um, as as um, we go through this so the other thing that I the other uh, brochure that I wanted to just um, make sure everyone had a copy of is our complaint procedure um, which is also um, on our website under our procedures and this is um, just something that we all should be aware of and again as a board you know if you review it and you feel like wait I, I think we need to make some changes to it please you know let let me know and we can put it on the agenda that's something to work on um, but for now this is our complaint procedure um, and, and I had uh, all of these brochures are are um, they're located in the OSED office and I believe they're all also sung in each one of the schools in the district so um, they're out there but I don't I, I you don't always know if people know that they're there or if they grab them. So anyway, I just wanted to make sure that we all had it and, and are familiar with it. Um, okay, so next up, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about monitoring just because as we are continuing on um, and trying to learn and, and get better at um, being board members um, and, and learning how to follow our, our policies. Um, the monitoring part is pretty important in terms of holding uh, Lane accountable and, um, and being sure that we're, we're doing what we need to be doing. And at the same time, um, hopefully getting a system in place so that we're not spending hours and hours looking back in the past but but spending our time looking forward and and um, engaging with our community engaging um, with what's happening in education so that we can continue to improve our system so one of the things that i wanted to do was to just hopefully everyone had a chance to review um, the material from our training in the summer and I put together some questions that we could just sort of talk about and make sure that we were sort of all uh, sort of on, on board and clear about about the role of monitoring in our governance system. So um, are you all able to kind of review those those um, sections of the of the training? Are people able to get to them? So are you able to? Um, so I'm just going to kind of go. I'm going to pose those questions. So, um, what role do our policies have in monitoring in the monitoring process? If we were to sort of think about that, what is what is the purpose of our of our policies? Our end policies are executive limitations. Have we all had a chance to kind of think think through that and digest from the training? helpful for the if we if we look at that material together as a group and just sort of review it um, the monitoring information 
or do people feel like they are clear on how the monitoring fits in with our the way our board works? Hello. <laughs> um, so, Anne, I appreciate you putting together these questions to discuss the monitoring because I think that's helpful just to get the thought process started. Um, I, I, I guess I feel like it's pretty clear, the monitoring process. It's pretty clear, and I, from what I've seen over the last few meetings since I've started, Lane's very thorough sort of description of what he does to, you know, sort of meet those, meet the monitoring standards seems very clear and um, like it doesn't need to be fixed. That being said, other than him reporting back, I don't know how to go further than that and have it be like checked by other people and if that's a process that needs to be put in place on the policy level I'm not quite sure mm -hmm. so what is what are people on the board thinking in terms of when we do get these monitoring reports, do we feel comfortable with the evidence that's, that's presented? I feel comfortable with it, but it's still that, that same issue that's always come up. And just what Chelsea said is everything is, looks great and is fine, but we don't know anything else is the, the, mm -hmm. the real thing. And I don't know how you would find anything else out. I mean, I don't have any reason to, to you know, to suspect there's anything going on, but we only know what's in these reports. Well, that's a good point, Brian. Like, for instance, in, um, there, what, it's not it's really about a, relations between this yeah. party and this party, if it's being recorded and the, the rationale and the evidence is being. Yeah, I mean, I have no reason to suspect there's anything different and, and Lane seems to be doing right. a, a great job of you know, no reason to suspect anything else but you don't, don't know what you know. don't know mm -hmm. exactly right. Right. and I don't know how we do that and still meet all our policies right what, what else we would ask to see exactly I don't know what we would ask but um, so I think like um, in some cases you have outside folks that are checking to yeah. Uh, especially on the financials, which is the biggest, outside of the kids, that's the biggest sacred trust that we have. Um, and so that's the auditors that are, that are in working every year, um, which I think is important. But we, this was a quandary way back when I kind of started and kind of looking back at the past and going, yeah, this is a limitation here. So I, I would argue a few things is, um, if there are things that are concerning there, and I'm not providing you with an adequate explanation, or I provide you with an adequate explanation, but people are still coming to the board, um, you know, months later complaining about the same thing. Those are things that you might want to do a direct investigation with. And usually that's getting an outside person to come in and say, hey, these are the things that we're concerned about, go take a look. Yeah. And that's perfectly appropriate. Um, and, and, and you should do that if there, if there are concerns. That come out. And the ESDA will help us with that, right? What's that? The PSDA would help us with that. Oh, yeah, and PHO would, would guide you. He'll, he would connect you with a, an outside person who does kind of investigations um, tailored to, you know, specific specific pieces that you're concerned about. Has that ever been done in this district that we know of? Um, I, I have at my level for things that this might be a conflict of interest if I'm the one that's looking at it. Mm -hmm. So we've had folks come in and, and take a look. Or what they needed to look at was um, so nuanced in terms of uh, the law, I didn't want to screw it up. And so I wanted somebody else to come and, and do that. Um, I think one of the 
things that should have happened a little bit more often years years ago was there were times that you know the board was hearing repeatedly of the same you know concerns and whatnot um, and I think being told that things were okay but yet the concerns were still there that those would have been times it would have been time to have someone take a look because um, usually the community kind of knows or the teachers kind of know what's going on um, and so I, I think that's important but that's usually the telltale sign it if you're getting serious con complaints and concerns and I've come in and I said, you know, it's, it's been resolved and there's still serious concerns coming up months later, that's the time to take a look. It seems to me too, I mean, the way our policies are, they're covering so many, so many aspects that it would be hard if it's not monitored, if we're not getting evidence from one area, we're getting it from another area. Um, but that's where I think as we as we look at these monitoring reports and we look at the interpretation that that Wayne is giving us, I think we need to be thinking about it, is this reasonable? And then and then the evidence. Um, one of the things I was reading about, um, and I've heard Susan, the, our train the trainer, speak about is observable conditions like like. What would you see, you know, what would you see? You know, you'd see job descriptions, you'd see this, and, and, and I think, you know, you'd see systems in place that, um, so I think as we look at evidence, we wanna make sure that there's sort of a, a systemic sort of process for things in, in, in the main, you know, in the functioning of the organization so that, um, and if folks haven't seen these, um, especially with the monitoring reports, um, when it's possible, you know, the sample evidence, I try to actually include it in the narrative. It's not always possible. And so um, these, the, the current two that we're working on are always sitting on top of the bookshelf that anybody can come in and look. But the supplemental evidence is, is always in there. And that's always good to look at too, because if you look at it and, um, so you look at it and go, well, this doesn't really fit what he's saying, or um, there are other things that we that that we think would be a better indicator. You know, those are those are things that the board certainly has a has a right to request. Um, so, but that's important and too. That's, that's the type of thing when we're looking at that interpretation uh, on the monitoring report that, that we just want to. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, that we that we look at that interpretation closely when we're looking at the monitoring reports, because that's where we would we would um, take a look at his interpretation and, and maybe ask for something more or say you know, we need it. Mm -hmm. But but I I think part of the concern is that the more that we may want wouldn't necessarily come from like the more that you know right I mean? right or we could say right but we could his interpretation could include I don't know an anonymous survey or you know something something I think else or what would be nice if even if it's just that if we could get some information that would confirm that Lane's stuff is is that is right on I mean, and then, does it mean it just feels like we're going through the motions? Because I mean, everything that Lane gives us looks like everything's good. Do we just assume that? I don't, you know, I don't know any different that we don't do that. And but I don't know how we would, especially with our policies, where we are kind of limited to only real contact with Lane. So how do we, you know, right. interact with to get that? kind of confirmation that his information is correct. So usually the, you know, that would be a, hey, you know, it would be brought up in, in a meeting and say, hey, you know, we'd like a little bit more, the board would, would make a motion, would move on it. Um, I mean, there are people in the district that can take a peek, peek at things. Um, you know, there's always Robin in the business office if it's on the financial. You know, we work closely together, but we're separate entities. And if she's fibbing, she's up, the creek you know as much as i am uh, in different ways and so you know you got a person who's probably going to be pretty straight up honest with you 
um, the you got the tech directors, you got the principals you can shoot the breeze with, um, and, and those sorts of things. But usually it, it is it's um, the I, the proper process would be hey you know we've got these concerns this is what we'd like to see, and then the board would just vote on what you wanted to do uh, because there is always the right for an outside inspection. But you can't approach them individually, correct? Right. Board, board, you have to have the board's right. authority yeah. to. Right. Yeah. Right. And that's where, so the way the way we've been doing the monitoring is we've been trying to, after we monitor a couple of our policies, that's why we keep going, going then to um, taking a look at those policies and seeing if we want to change them at all. Because first we're going to be monitoring, and if it seems reasonable his interpretation then at that point as long as it's it seems re the board looks at it and says yep this is a reasonable interpretation of the policy and he's provided evidence to support that reasonable interpretation then we accept then we accept the report but then what we can then do is change that policy to dive a little bit deeper if we feel like it's not getting enough of what we what we need in order to feel comfortable that things are working as we we would want them to work or so can i ask a question oh chelsea why don't you go first if you don't want to and then i'll go after you um can everybody hear me i'm having a little bit of a hard time hearing the discussion that's happening in the room i think um, but what I was going to say, and I don't, in an effort to not create, you know, more work, because it seems like every single topic could use a subcommittee just to get stuff done before the next meeting, um, it would seem like a subcommittee would be an idea that would look at next month's monitoring reports or next month's monitoring questions, I guess, and be like, how can we check in on this? Should we ask this outside person or that outside person? And then, you know, report back to the board, we agree with Lane's monitoring report, or we disagree and we want to look into it more, or we disagree and don't want to look into it more. I mean, I don't know. It just seems like everything needs just a little bit more time and effort put into it than what we do. It used to, in the, uh... I think it was my first year here. Um, what used to happen was the board would, there was usually two people that were kind of designated and they would at least show up at the office, they'd go through the folders. They had a little rubric, the rubrics are still in the folders by the way. And they would just take a, a, a deep look at things and then kind of report back to the board, you know, when you guys got to the point where you were approving or voting on the, the memo is they bring up hey yeah no it looked good or no it looked like there are some things missing that we, that we might want to ask for um and so that was a process that was in place um you know i think my first year um, the other fo piece to know is that um as a agency that you know is receiving funding from both uh state agencies and federal agencies there are a lot of uh, folks that are coming in always looking at things and um, be guaranteed that if they see something that's out of whack, the first person that letter goes to, it'll go to me and it'll go to, to, go to the board as a whole. Um, and so that's another, another protection um, that's there as well. Uh, you know, if we're failing to do something that's required and there's a lot of things that are required to do, you know, the, the agency of education or the, the secretary of education would say, hey, you know, it looks like Looks like you guys are missing this, this, and this. What's going on? And that would go directly to the board. So along the lines kind of, of, of what Rachel said about we don't know, we don't know, um, I'm wondering if there's ever any way to, you know, we have our policies right now. We're kind of, I feel like we're kind of like the cat chasing its tail right now because we don't know, we don't know what we don't know, and we don't know what we should be asking for. We don't know how we should define that in our policies. Is it worth looking into, um, and I don't know if this is a service that the um, DSBA does, but having somebody review our policies who understands school policy and is like, okay, this has been however many years it's been since they've been created, 
these are some things that have come up in the in the preceding years that maybe you want to frame some language around. So I feel like we don't know where the language needs to change, but we're continuously having these kind of conversations that are just spinning in that circle. And maybe there's things that someone else could come in and would be able to look at our policies and say, okay, these look good. You may want to specify some language around this aspect here. This is what other schools have found to be helpful. It helps with their monitoring reports on this end, and you'll get this information included. So, because I feel like we could just talk about this for. Yeah, and you guys actually have one of the most well developed policies in terms of EL that's been around. But, it uh, hasn't but, but been. you are right, if, if things have changed, yeah. um, you know, do, are there areas that we need to, should be looking at other things differently because the regulatory or the landscape has changed around the world? It's a good point. It's 2016, right? Is that when they were adopted? Yes. Yeah, I think so. You guys probably had a couple of years of work before, though, I'm sure. Yeah, adopted in 2016. Yeah. Well, and that work was not done, that work was obviously done in conjunction with somebody advising, I'm assuming. Yes. Megan raised her hand. I saw it. She did. Megan, did you have a comment or a question? Megan, do you have a question? I, I don't know if you guys are speaking to me, and I'm sorry to interrupt if you're not, but earlier in the meeting, I could see the room and I could hear everybody, and now I can't hear. When, when everyone else is talking other than Lynn, I can't hear anything. It might, like it might just out. be the distance of the, to the owl. But it was okay in the RTCC meeting? It was fine earlier. Even in the beginning of this meeting was fine, and now it's cutting out. I think we're talking a little softer, too. Oh, Jeff, well, we're in theater, right? Okay. Did you have did you have a question about or or a comment in, uh, regarding the monitoring discussion, Megan? No, she can't. Oh, uh, not necessarily. I didn't hear everything that was said, so I was just trying to uh -huh. see if we could fix the sound. Sorry, I just I can't hear anything except for Lane. All right, we have an IT person taking a look. Hopefully, that'll make a difference. Okay, so um, should I should I see or should I wait? What do you? Okay, give it just a second. Let me just see. It's interesting. That is much better. Okay. I mean, I don't know. Were you having problems too, Chelsea? Yeah. How about now, Megan? Can you hear me? Uh, yep. Can you hear me now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, what what had come up, Megan, was um, Hannah had, or no, it was Katya was was um, saying that maybe maybe what we need is to have some kind of uh, maybe uh, somebody from the VSBA or someone who's familiar with policy governance at the school level to take a look at our policies and help us kind of think about what areas maybe. Um, we might want to tweak them one way or the other. Uh, okay. Um, I, I don't know if somebody said this before, um, but I was looking at the monitoring discussion questions that you had sent out, and I, I feel comfortable with the overall monitoring process, um, but I was feeling like I don't know enough about the policies themselves, whether or not we are 
sufficiently, you know, approving whatever Lane is providing with us or providing to us and knowing whether or not it's it's enough or if, if he's not, you know, it's hard to know. So that was my only concern was just like, if we had clarity around our actual policies, I would feel the same way. Mm -hmm. Like I would feel better if I knew more about the policies themselves versus, or I guess before we go in and monitor them and say, yes, this is good. Like, is it? What do other school districts do? You know, how do we know we are including everything that we need within the policy or do we not have enough or does Lane agree with the policies? You know, like what, you know, what is his take? Do, does he wish we asked for more, less? You know things like that i don't know that was that was kind of my overall feeling i don't know what other people said sorry about that <laughs> no that's okay sorry sorry that you that our tech wasn't working right it's um, it almost feels like people are expressing a need to feel some ownership over the policies right mm -hmm, so we know mm -hmm. if we're getting what we want because they are our policies the people who are actually in the on the board now mm -hmm. Sure, I would agree with that. It's our policies look good to me, you know, <laughs> but is it enough or is it too much? Mm -hmm. So maybe someone from our board should reach out to the Vermont School Boards Association and sort of get organized with them about looking at them, seeing if they're current, seeing if they're adequate. And then a couple people from our board should look at it and every month sort of say, is this it? Is it, I mean, we could just implement the process that was in place, like Lane said, the first year he was here. I'm not quite sure why that stopped, but it sounds like that was what we're all kind of talking about. Like two people going into the office, taking the, the form, just making sure that everything fit into the boxes, like, in terms of being complete and being accurate and being you know successful i guess so i'm i'm actually hearing two things i'm hearing maybe looking for a consultant or someone to help us review the actual policies that we have and then also i'm hearing and maybe we want to try the the old way of having two people so you have another board member to sit with and look at a policy together and look at the binder and and have a discussion um, as you're looking at the at the evidence that's uh, supporting the monitoring report and looking at the interpretation of the monitoring, monitoring report is that what is that what everybody else heard yeah and I think both both hold value I don't think it has to be one or the other. Right, right. Um, so uh, one thing, I guess from here, Rachel. Oh, Rachel. I guess one thing I wonder about is if that was the way it was done, and it's not done that way anymore, is there a reason? And is it a good reason? And if it's not done that way anymore, was there a failure? And where did the failure come? Why did that, why was that policy or that way of doing things where two people would go and look at the binder. Why was that moved away from? Ask, asking com, com, complicated questions. I do know that I was frustrated about preparing the binders when nobody was coming and looking at them. <laughs> um, there was a lot of transition. Um, and I, I think, think there was a lot wrong with the, there were a lot of things going wrong with the district. In, at that period in terms of, of yeah and I think and, the board had no idea and I think things were dysfunctional and and so you know, so the board looking at the, like the two people going to look at the binder didn't protect us from things going wrong true and, but again that was and I, I was actually the one that brought it up to the board the exact conversation that you were happening three years ago as I looked and I said the problem is is that um, you're only getting information from the superintendent. Uh, I can put whatever I want in there, and as long as it looks good, you're not gonna know the things that I'm not showing you. And so we still never, we even had a training on it. I don't know if that was the first year, it was sometime in there. It's probably, it, was, it was probably closer to the beginning of the second year. 
to try to come up with, well, how do we resolve this? And the only thing that I could come up with, um, and even with the trainer couldn't come up with anything better, was just that idea, is that if you are getting complaints, um, and that was the idea that I presented, if you are getting complaints, um, and I've told you that I fixed it, and I've shown you evidence, and you're still getting complaints about the same thing, it's time to take a look. Because when I look back to previous years, that seemed to be the pattern that would have told people something was up. And so that's the only solution I was able to come. We didn't get a, a good answer from. Well, the answer we actually got, I think I remember her words, was if you can't trust your superintendent to be putting those things in there properly, you've got other things to be worried about. That was her words. But, I mean, maybe we do just what you said. If we don't hear any complaints, we just assume everything is good. Because yeah. there are checks, uh, outside checks on the major things. Yes. Uh, about treatment of staff and things like that. You know, if you're getting constant complaints, you know, he's coming in and he's screaming at, at people all the time. Um, and you come to me and you ask me about it and I can't explain it in a rational way or a way that makes sense and you're still getting complaints and then dang it, you need to check. Um, I think this connects though to our a discussion coming up I, about ownership linkage, about how we hear complaints, about you know how we're allowed to hear complaints what mm -hmm. we're allowed to do with the complaints i think there's a lot of um we need a lot of clarity there in order to uh, have to, uh, to be available to receive the information that may or may not contradict what we're getting in the report but your conflict resolution protocol it does a few things that are very important and the first one is it's making sure that a complaint goes through multiple tiers so no one can control, no single person can control the information. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is there, there's that aspect to it. That's a good way to set things up because if they're not happy with what I've said or what I've done, they've got the board. If they're not happy with what the principals have done, they've got me. If they're not happy with what the teacher has, has, has worked with them, they've got the principals and on and up. So if somebody were to actually get all the way up to the board, they've had five or six people that are, are in the loop on that information and, and what's going on, who can, who can talk and the board could check in with you know, by the time you got to your level. So that is a pretty good system. And that's one of the reasons to maintain that, those levels. Mm -hmm. Outside of the fact it's just good relationship building to try to get people to, to work. So, Again, I'm just making, think, I'm thinking off the cuff, so mm -hmm. it's just, it doesn't mean I'm like. So is there any more, um, any more points that folks want to make in terms of the, so how do we want to proceed from here? Would, would you like me to contact the VSBA and should we do that as a separate training or education process? Or you want me to find the information first and then I can let folks know, you know, we could do this with a subcommittee or the trainer says we should all do it together or what have you. Well, I, I thought that it, it was more of a consultant kind of looking at our policies, not that the, the training part would come later, but that okay. the first, uh, reaching out would be about if they even provide that service for someone to know mm -hmm. okay. and see how current they are. They I would imagine they would want to do that with us. Right. right. The right. subcommittee of the board. They're not going to want to do that. It's just, I don't know for sure. But I don't, I don't think they'll just take our policies and like look at them and then give us a report on them. I suspect they'll want to sit down with us mm -hmm. to look at them. Yeah, and I think a good thing would be to, is if we could explain, you know, some of our concerns to these, you know, an expert say just like what we said you know we trust the information we get from lane but how can we write in the policy to try to get a little information that doesn't come from lane you know if we have these concerns you know i, I don't know enough about how to write a policy to get any additional information but that would i think would be handy to have is to be able to you know kind of ask somebody you know how can we write it to get what we want. And they did do a, they do offer a service the SBA to do a review of policy. Uh, we actually use them 
took them a little while to get going on it, but we use them to do the, the your required policies. Not yes. the governance policies, but the yes. federally required in the state. So I don't know if that service also goes to a governance policy. I mean, the state does espouse policy governance, so it seems like they would have somebody who might be able to do that. But they wanted us to, like, they had a group of us sit down with them to do that. Yes, no. I went to your office and sat with. What oh, that, but they, 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 reviewed the they reviewed the policies, they had a report, and they kind of went through the pieces and said, this is what you're missing. Yes. Yeah. 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 Right, but they looked at them and, and analyzed them. And gave us, that, that, gave us the okay. report and had that's a conversation. What I'm saying. So we're looking for somebody who knows policy governance to, to look at our policies. To do an audit. Yeah. Is probably the okay. best word. So, so I can do that. Um, and... And report that information back to the board, um, and then we can decide if we want to. Or does the board want to go ahead and and make a motion that to contact somebody? And if they do have somebody at DSBA that will do that, do you want me to go ahead and engage them in that? I say, yeah, go ahead yeah. and engage them. Let's I mean, move. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. So we should probably have a motion to that effect. So, someone want to make that motion? I move that and contact the DSBA and inquire whether they provide a service to audit our policies, and if so, engage them to do so. Second. Second from Ashley. Uh, any discussion? looking at you Chelsea and Megan just because I, I keep forgetting I'm looking at the room and forgetting that I need to look up there uh, so uh, can we call a question then all in favor aye aye, aye. aye. okay so yeah. okay and I probably got us off time with that discussion but I think it's important because I think we were we were um, We've been struggling with this for a while, so hopefully this will be helpful. Um, so next up, I just wanted to put on the radar that we are um, going to be working on an annual um, an annual report to the voters. It's going to be due in January, um, and I wanted folks to think about. Um, what we wanted to report out to our voters. And I'm wondering if folks... Well, isn't it pretty, um, like, typical year to year, what is kind of expected for us to vote, like, report out on? I have to look at past ones, but I'm assuming it kind of follows a similar... Yes, but this is also, I mean, this is also a time we as a board can decide what what we want to focus on uh, and share with the community and what we think. It, it, it seems to me that we should share the ENDS report, like was reported last, at the last meeting, mm -hmm. which brings me to my next question. If <laughs> How do we how do we shift the finances so that we don't have a three point two million dollar surplus and we can't meet our ends because we don't have the people or the programs in place to meet the ends? Like, how do we change that? That's sure. <laughs> what I'd like to know. But I think that the community should know that that's a thing and that should be reported. But I don't. I don't I'm only one person. Did, I didn't know if you wanted me to answer the process, what the process would look like, or is that more just a general I don't, I don't know. I don't know where to begin. Um, general process, so whenever there is uh, money that's left at the end of the year, it's called surplus. And then typically what we do is we go out to the voters um, and ask them to put the, that extra money into reserve funds so that we've got money sitting there so that we get big projects that come up. We don't have to go out to bed, you know, and take a loan out and, and whatnot. Um, when the voters vote, they vote for what purpose the money can be used for. Like we have a facilities reserve fund that you guys um, will be 
potentially tapping into today, you know, to do that outdoor classroom. Um, the voters set the parameter, the, you know, the, the whole townsfolk when they vote in March of what it can be used for. And then after that, um, the board gets to decide if when we're coming and making requests for it, if uh, we're allowed to use it. So then it turns over to you. So if you were deciding that you wanted this to be, you know, we've got a significant amount of money sitting in facilities and transportation. If you decided that you would like to see that being used to help out with staffing, the thing that we would have to do is put on the budget um, vote uh, that comes up in March is a request to the community to transfer that money from the facilities account to the operational fund because the operational fund we could then use for staff. And so that would have to be a vote that the, the communities would have to make. And if that were an intent, that would need to be something that um, was well explained and that might be something to explain as part of the annual report to the voters. This is what we need, this is the goal that we are attempting to achieve by this. And so, you know, we hope for your support. Because usually the, the annual reports are really to kind of um, inform the vote the voters before they go to vote mm -hmm. you know this is what we've done this is why why we, why we want your vote and what we're going to be doing okay that makes sense to me so so just process wise so the annual report comes out and then for the town meeting for the school budget like for brookfield is that a thing that brian and i have to go to or is it just decided in randolph or is it like how does that work Linda's Sorry, actually the, the, the wrong time and place to talk about this. Yeah, Linda's actually the voting expert. Um, the reality is, is the process for the towns and their voting for their budgets is completely separate from the schools. They happen on the same day and the same time, but we are separate entities when it comes to budgeting. Um, and so this is a discussion that the board itself could have. Um, but again, there are certain pieces, like if, if that money is sitting in reserve funds, and you want to use it for a different purpose than the town voters originally said it should be used for, you have to have them make another vote to assign it for a new purpose. Well, and we do have the annual. Okay, one more quick, the night one more quick, oh, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. One more quick question. How much is a reasonable amount that's necessary in those reserve funds for transportation and facilities? So in terms of the reserve funds, there, I didn't, don't quote me. Um, if I had, were a little bit more awake, I'd go right into the financials and tell you how much is there. There is probably 2.8 million in the facilities reserve fund. And one of the reasons that we held on so tightly to it was because we had no clue how much it was gonna cost um, to like replace the roof at Randolph that was coming due. Um, we expected it to be in the one to two million dollar range. I believe, and I gotta, gotta go back and get the numbers, I believe the cost to actually replace the roof and all the mechanicals up there and do the HVAC upgrades was less than a million dollars. So I, I would argue a million to a million five is probably gonna cover any major expense that we might have, in, have coming up in the facilities fund. The transportation fund, typically what we try to do um, is we use that to try to replace the two oldest school buses every year. Um, and so, you know, a school bus, I don't know with the supply chain issues this year, a school bus is usually about $88,000. Um, but we also use it, we have various fleet vehicles in and around the district, like that was, you guys are potentially tapping into the transportation fund um, today to replace two of the, the aged uh, trucks that the facilities crew uses for a variety of things from plowing to moving things around and not having to pay people 55 cents a mile to drive between the buildings because they're so far apart. Um, so that one would take a little bit more math. Um, I would probably say if you had to call me on it tonight, if we had, if we had 600,000 in there, that would be reasonable. How much is in there now? My guess is, again, don't quote me, but my guess is probably in the one to one point two million dollar range. Yeah, Lane, it's on. It's on here. Actually, on here. Oh, you got it on there. Yeah, yeah. How far off am I? You're right on, actually. Two point six, two point seven. Oh, good. So, so, so you have some outside <laughs> evidence, and they actually do review the financials. Uh, can I? Can I just say two things? 
One is that I can send out, if you guys want, to report to voters from last year, just so you have a sample, if you don't have an old town report, you know, in the town reports. And the other thing is next month, I'll be bringing the first draft of the warning. And that's where, you know, the budget amount will be on and also uh, what you'd want to figure out for research funds. Yeah, and that's the, that's the piece that goes out. There's a certain time frame for it that tells the voters, this is what we're asking for. You might want to get informed about why. Um, but yeah, that's, it, that's important. Yep. The other piece to recognize is that during COVID, um, we did kind of shift priorities. And, and this is actually part of the budget discussion that, that we would hit anyway, so it's, it's apropos. Um, we were traditionally always taking surplus money and we were pumping it into the reserve funds. Um, one of the ones that we still should be putting money into um, is the special education reserve fund because they are revamping the entire way that special education is funded starting this July and they have not done their requisite training of folks of what the impacts are gonna be or, and what it's gonna look like. Um, and things are still kind of up in the air on the weightings and whatnot. Um, and so two years ago, anticipating this, I requested for a reserve fund to be put into place so that if we got into the middle of a year, we had five kids move in that, that needed significant services, we had a way to cover it without, without destroying the, the whole district budget. But other than that, what we did last year because of COVID, um, instead of putting the money into reserve funds, um, we put it into an operational fund so that we could use it to subsidize the next three years budget. So we put a whole bunch of money in there. We took half of it out to subsidize this budget so the taxpayers weren't gonna be on the hook for as much. And then the half that is left, we're gonna use half of that half for next year. That's what we guaranteed the voters we would do and half of that half of the following year. Because we figured by the end of three years, whatever negative impact um, COVID was having on the educational fund would be cleared up and you know we would be able to do our own thing without those subsidies again. Or we decide as a group that, hey, we don't need to be putting money in the reserve funds. We just continue to use those surpluses to, sur to, to subsidize the next year's budget. I don't know if I made any sense or not. I'm hoping I did. <laughs> it was a lot. <laughs> uh, so it seems like we should report to our owners some of that information yeah. so that come tax time or come voting time, we can move some of that money over to the other side so that we can meet our ends in a more timely way. And that is a, could be a very good use for that. I also think that in the report to the voters, we should acknowledge the staff and the past year of um, working in COVID and the way that people, um, the way that this team within these buildings modified their roles and responded. So I think there should be an acknowledgement of that. Excellent, yeah. Great idea. Okay, we're, we're gonna have some time to, to kind of get this report together. So um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna, unless somebody's got something that they're dying to say, um, I, I, I want folks to be thinking about sort of the other questions. I think I sent that out too, sort of like, you know, um, uh, if anybody wants to get be involved in the actual writing of the report um, and how we want to do this, um, just sort of think about those things, and um, we'll we'll probably be revisiting this because it needs to be ready for January, I believe. Right? We've got to have it by January. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, As the town reports is collected. Okay, so I'm gonna move on then to our next um, agenda category where we're gonna be looking at those monitoring reports. So again, we can kind of use this as an opportunity to kind of look carefully at the interpretations that were given um, for these um, monitoring reports and, and judge whether or not we feel like they are reasonable. Um, and 
um, and decide if we uh, feel like we have sufficient evidence for the interpretation that Lane has given us. And then we will take a vote on the uh, monitoring report. So I'm going to have us start with 2.1. Um, and this is the report on the treatment of students, parents, and community. Um, and the question is, um, the questions we need to be looking at are, is his interpretation uh, reasonable? And do we have uh, a sufficient rationale for that interpretation? and the compliance standard that he set forth and then also um, is the evidence or observable conditions sufficient to establish that compliance now, i i just have some i have some li i took the time this time to kind of look more carefully at these reports um, and one of the things that I found is like under provision one in this report um, it would be nice if it if I ha if it was more um, observable conditions to to assure to assure this outcome so um, we have no information has been collected that exceeds either that needed to inform the board's ends and initiatives, nor that needed to comply with state and federal regulations and mandates. And what might be helpful for me is just to know, I don't know what you already collect. So it's not like I need to see what you collect, but we collect, you know, just sort of a list. You know, we collect this, this, and this, and who does it? And um, the other thing um, that I was thinking about is um, you might list to um, what policies and procedures are in place to guide employees and the system as a whole in regard to collecting information. Just to have that listed there. You know, like we have these these policies, these procedures, so that you know, again, as board members, we kind of know this is the system you have in place, so that we're assured that if we went in, we would see that. Do you follow me? Mm -hmm. And I don't—that's my opinion, board people. <laughs> I don't know if if others feel like that would be helpful. But again, as we're looking at our policies and looking at um, his interpretation, um, you know, the interpretation too, it's sort of hard to, um, you, your interpretation is that families will only be asked information that is required for the district. Um, but it's so how do we know that you know what i mean well that was um, one of the questions that we had is sometimes the evidence is a lack of evidence and how do you right so what i tried to do in the report was i made sure that everything that we collected that was above what was required by the state for us to submit i listed that's what that's what the narrative is, is talking about so you know we talked about um, the modality surveys that we were collecting right. last year to see, you know, where people were in terms of remote um, and those sort of things. So any any kind of, of out of the norm data collections or that was the purpose of trying to list them there, which is yeah. to say, hey, these were the these were the odd ones out that we don't usually do. So I'm yeah. presenting it to you to decide if you think this fits or not. Yeah. Well, what I'm wondering is, do we want evidence in there that says these are the things that we typically collect? And these are the policies and procedures that you don't necessarily have to tell us what, but these are the policies and procedures that govern who collects what and for what reason. This is where they're, where they are. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just, uh, again, kind of 
thinking about what one is easy to read because when it's when it's lengthy and um, a lot of words to read it, it, it sometimes makes it a little bit harder um, to kind of assess and again what I'm thinking about is it would be nice to see sort of the systemic things that are in place to, to, um, to uh, manage the district and to manage information. But I may be, that's my opinion. I don't know what the rest of the board is, is thinking, but that was one of the things that I noticed in that, in that section. I feel like that's a level of detail I don't need to have. That this the state has certain things that our schools have to know about students coming in, and our educational professionals know what those are. And families aren't complaining to me that their privacy is being violated, that they're asked, they're being asked inappropriate things by the school. So if he's saying he's not doing it, then you're okay. I'm okay. But that's my opinion. I second that opinion. That. I think it's it's if we don't hear again if we don't hear anything I don't think it's it's probably we shouldn't worry about if there's something out there that we're not hearing I think all of us are involved enough in the community that we would probably one of us would hear something if it was out there so I, think I, I like the report kind of the way they are with it being fairly okay. simple but I appreciate your, not to cut you off, Brian, sorry. Oh, go ahead. I appreciate that you're like thinking critically about what else could we be examining here. Like, what are we not seeing? Right. And I right. feel like that kind of thinking needs to be applied to each of our, like each point of each of the policies. And that's actually what we're getting at when we're like, what are we not seeing? What don't we know? Right. The only concern that I have is uh, I don't want to spend every month just writing reports. Exactly. There, there is a significant amount of just so so yeah. if there are critical things I would argue certainly you tell you as a board you tell me the additionals happy to add but if, if we were to add something because that is actually a pretty major piece I could do chapters on, <laughs> on what's collected and why they why they collect it that that's pretty simple to do yeah, and, and, and most um, of it's just demographics, and it's the data they need to see if we're, if uh, you know, we're maintaining equity between our different subgroups is, is a lot of what they collect. Yeah. <clears throat> like uh, in provision four, with the evidence, you like boom, 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 um, and that's, you know, that sort of lets you know, okay, these are the observable conditions that we would see. Yeah. Provision one, like I said, a lot of it's 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 hard because it's one of those it's a lack of right 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 evidence that makes you need it. Okay. Um, so is everyone uh, ready? And they they've looked at this policy. Feel like they've got a, a reasonable interpretation and, and evidence. Yes. So do we have a motion to accept it? I make a motion that we accept um, policy 2.1 uh, as submitted the treatment of students, parents, guardians, and community. The monitoring report, report. accept the monitoring report. Okay, do we have a second? A second. And any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, and then the next one uh, is treatment of staff. So same, same thing. Um, as we take a look at uh, Lane's interpretations of what that means and the evidence that he's providing for that. Are people? Do we have some? Discussion on any of the interpretations that he has for that. The rationale or evidence. Okay. 
Lane, are you back this year to doing the weekly visits at the different sites? I started out early, um, the first month or so, and it's fallen apart given uh, everything that blows up every day. Right. Um, we're in, and I, I mean this kindly, the staff legitimately are very overworked. Um, there's a lot of tears. Um, there's a lot of trying to find the best way to say it. Um, things just self-destruct uh, right now because people are under, have been under a constant state of tension with COVID and everything else in the world. I mean, we're going on our third year with COVID now. And so, and I predict that that is going to get worse probably at least through February. It's going to continue to go downhill. Um, hopefully by February, one of two things are going to happen. It's going to break in such a way that, um, you know, like, like sometimes arguments break, right? All of a sudden people wake up one day and, and, and it's over. Um, or it may break down. Um, I can't predict. But things are in a tough state right now. And that's across all schools across. It's not just here. Um, and so, yeah, um, that's made it difficult. My, my job is 100% human resources right now. That's all I do from time, time I walk in the door until 9, 10 o'clock at night. Linda can, you can see Linda shaking her head. <laughs> she knows. <laughs> um, and just trying to, you know, so, some of it's, you know, more more severe things. Um, a lot of it is, you know, like today, a lot of it was just people that are tense and just need to come in and vent for an hour and get it off their chest and need somebody to listen. You know, so that's a lot of the job right now, too. And it keeps things, it keep things, keeps things moving forward. It doesn't fix it. Uh, that's, that the, Whatever's happening in the world's got to change for, for, for that to be fixed, but it keeps things moving. Yeah. Now that has been extremely difficult this year. So given that you're not doing those, Remember, this is looking at last year, not this year. Oh, this is last year. Oh, so it's, so it's going to be the next year's monitoring of. But see, that's where it might be helpful to have a list. Like the plan is to go monthly, and you can have kind of a chart. And again, even if you're not necessarily doing what you said you were going to be doing, you can explain it. Mm -hmm. And if it's a reasonable explanation, we, you know, you can accept it. Yeah. Um, but I don't, I don't know. I mean, what do other board members think? Or should we be saying, oh, wait a minute, you're supposed to be doing that, and you haven't done that, when we look at the next one? So the whole time during COVID, well, mm -hmm. Well, he gets COVID. evidence here because it says hindered somewhat by COVID. So he does give right. evidence that yeah. you know it was not able to happen as it normally does. And right. maybe my question was out of line, asking about this year because I know this is a last year report. I was just curious, right. so I wasn't yeah. trying to. No, I, usually I just, it was it was good. Usually how it works, and again, that's part of the, when we get into the budget discussion that there's only one of me. Um, Usually how it starts in a good year, if it were without COVID, is usually right up until heavy budget season, probably December. I can be rock solid, consistent about it. Um, and then when the other work starts to take over, there just physically is not the time. Mm -hmm. you know? And that's you know, one of the things I always, I always laugh um, when you do like interviews for uh, administrators is because one of the things the parents are, are you gonna be out on the play fields? Yeah, I'm, I'm, we'll be out on the play fields, but you got to recognize if you're out on the play fields all the time, work's not getting done. So you either want somebody who's doing the work, or or hopefully somebody can find a balance in there. And right now things aren't balanced. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, the the amount of uh, increased work um, is just it's it's ungodly. It's about the only way I can put it. I'm I'm kind of wrestling with something here because. Um, Given what the discussion we were just having, where if if we still are receiving complaints or have evidence to the contrary, 
that that should be where we say, hmm, that's not what I'm hearing. So the, there are no, it, there were no incidents in 2021 and no complaint has been lodged relative the, to this provision. So that means too late. Correct. Because. Which number are we looking at? Well, uh, sorry, order? provision number two, um, the discriminate against any staff member for non-disruptive expression of dissent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if, if I um, was given information otherwise or uh, um, presented with an opinion otherwise, is, is this when I, this so, is what I'm wrestling with. Right, this is a, right. This is very so that's where when we, when we, well, first of all, it kind of depends on who it is. So if it's, if it's a parent or a community member, they would go through this complaint procedure. Mm -hmm. If it's, if it's an employee, we have the CBA, Mm -hmm. So if it's you know they would there is a complaint and grievance procedure through that, mm -hmm. um, and then there's I would imagine Lane and again that that is there a handbook for 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 staff that was one of the things I for staff that are not not part of the C, the CBA is it that's your there? conflict resolution protocol okay. So they would be following this? Yeah. And usually okay. even the principals are usually pretty good if, you know, the principals will say, hey, um, you know, if you're not happy with this, you know, the next step in the process is to talk to Mr. Millington. Um, whether people follow up or not, that's their, their, their prerogative. Usually the principals will give me a heads up about that, and if I don't hear anything, usually I'll reach out. Um, but uh, they also will give them, you know, the, the brochure a lot of times as well. So, if you're hearing from people. So this is a, I guess this is a question then too. So let's say that's the, and not that I'm saying that there is, but if the conflict's not internal, like if the conflict is against you, where does that individual, you're not, they're not going to like, oh, They should be going to you. They go to us. And I would direct them to do that. Okay. Yeah. I was like, because <laughs> there would always be so a, if that happened, then how can I accept the, or approve the that you're in compliance with this provision if you investigate uh, the investigator also has to take and come and talk to me about my context if something did happen mm -hmm. because it's not just what somebody says it's there may be more to the story so it's got to be a fair and, and reasonable process but yes that mm -hmm. would be the appropriate thing to do we would probably want to have an executive session with Outlane to make that decision to get an investigator to do that investigation, yeah. and then they would report back to us, and if they found that Lane was in the wrong, then we would have to make a decision. We would definitely say the, the report wasn't correct, but that's, I think that, I think that's the the, just, the yeah. process that we would go through. You, usually the best thing for you guys to do is if there's a concern, you throw it in the executive session and say, hey, this is what we're hearing, what happened. I tell you, and if, if, you, if, you, believe, if you believe me or don't believe me, that's your prerogative, and then you decide to go from there. Or if I tell you it's been resolved and you're still hearing complaints and you certainly do get an investigator. Yeah. So that but, the, but the piece that you can't forget, um, and the same thing is with staff and with students is you always have to talk with the other person mm -hmm. to know what's going on. Yeah, that's the due process. So that would happen before we got an investigator? How would you how would you we know? would talk with you Yeah, because you don't have the you don't have we enough have, you don't have, have enough point. info to be able to until you've talked with a yeah, heard both sides and then you guys make the decision. And then we decide to get an investigator. Yeah, we could. So what's the process of bringing something to us? Contact? I don't know. So, yeah. is contacting one board member? And, I mean, we have our complaint mm -hmm. procedure, so they they yep. would contact a board member, and the board member would would um, let's see, what does it say here? Uh, well, now you've got me curious. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I'm just I'm hypothetical because I feel like it's always important to know that. 
Uh, let's see. This so would be if the person is not a member of the, is well, not party to the CBA, otherwise they would go through the CBA. Well, if they, if they were CBA, they could still get to the board. So with the CBA, they go through the steps of the grievance. Yeah. Right. So the first is direct supervisor, kind of the same process. Second, after the direct supervisor, which is usually the principal, is me, that's the step two. Step three is board. And then if they're not happy with what the board says, then it's it's mediation arbitration. Yeah. But, but really, as a board, for us to make any action, it's really good. The first, if we get contact from somebody, it's if it's a complaint of the superintendent, then we do so. If, if it's not, if it's a complaint about the principal, we turn it over to Lane. Yeah. It's about me. You do what I do with the principal is you call them in and say, hey, I heard this. What's happening? Yeah. That's what you and then if, if we hear something about, about Lane, that's probably what we do is we pull Lane in and say, what's going on? And if we don't yeah. like his like answer, then we investigate it or exactly. we, you know, investigate ourselves with talk to the complainant or get someone to investigate it for us. But I think if it's we follow these procedures that you know, if it comes to the number five here, that's when we're, we step in. But anything else, we push down the line and they have to go through those procedures before we look at it. Yeah, and the other piece on your, your conflict resolution is unless they have been directed to talk directly to me, if that has not happened, then that's where they should be directed. Unless they're accusing, unless they're saying, oh, no, he sexually harassed me. Or if it's something at that level, then no, it doesn't get pushed back to me. That you guys do. You know, so, a, that's a whole different category of, like, from a. I'm still unclear with what I would do if someone came to me with a complaint. Did you in kind of an informal way. If, it, if, it's not, if it's not something. And it has to do with you. If it's not something horrific. Your procedures are clear. They need to talk with the first person that they're having an issue with. So, so I turn them back around. They should be talking to me. If they haven't talked with me first, um, then it's a problem. If the complaint's after they've talked with me, that's a board, board issue. Yeah. Unless it's something major they're accusing me of. You know, guy got brought a gun to school, guy threatened a kid. You know, that, that's crap. You put me out on leave, and then you, you guys, you know, talk to Pietro about the best way to investigate what what found out um, and kind of go from there. Yeah. Hmm. Does that get you fully confused, Hannah? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Does that get you fully confused? Um, not, I, I wouldn't say confused, but uh, still wrestling. Yeah. Internally. Well, hopefully having this now to help. And to a certain extent, but I, I, I think it's hard to apply everything to this very, it, it's, that's why I'm wrestling, right? I, I mean, I get the very stark line between egregious and, you know, he, I don't know, made me stub my toe. I, I get that. It's that. It's that gray area. It's that, um, you know, it, it, uh, I would say in, you intimidation gotta... is very gray, right? So it's it's hard. That that's that's what I'll say. That's why I'm wrestling. It's it's often hard for me to apply a very. This is the card, and this is one, two, three. What we do. Um, and, and I'll also say a little frustrating because I feel like some of these things have happened to a certain point with this group and then it kind of fizzled. And so it's, so it's frustrating to say, well, we'd call an executive session and we'd, you know, uh, well, I figure think, out I what think, to do and, and we did. I think at this point in time, <laughs> if there are accusations out there against me, I am demanding an executive session to hear what the accusations are. Because right now we're talking about me publicly, which is a little annoying with all these statements that could lead people to believe that I've actually done something wrong, which is quite bothersome, especially I because I don't know what the heck we're talking about. I can understand that, and mm -hmm. which is why I, 
I can understand that. I'll stop there. I'm, I'm not going to try to defend it or but, but no, otherwise. But no, we need to talk about this in executive session. <coughs> clear, clear the air on what it is. Sure. Yep. Okay, so are there any other um, questions about the treatment of staff? And again, as Ashley pointed out, this is a look back um, to last year. Um, and this year is, is happening now. But again, we're, when we, we are looking at these policies later on, and maybe we'll start skipping that section until we have our consultant, but um, you know, that was one of the things later on in the agenda we wanted to kind of look at, do we need to tweak any of these policies um, as they currently are? So um, anyway, so are we ready to take a vote on uh, either accepting or rejecting, or is there any more discussion on the interpretation or evidence um, put forth in the 2.2 treatment of staff policy? I make a motion that we approve uh, monitoring, monitoring report policy 2.2 treatment of staff as presented. Do I have a second? Uh, any other discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. Um, so, those have been passed. Um, we're going to have an update on the budget now from Lane. Yeah. And uh, folks will give me a moment or two. Um, I, get, I just got to get the presentation up. You good? Yeah, I'm good. All right. No, I'm fine. So, kind of budget process, and I think the biggest thing right now for folks to know is that we are early. Um, so you're going to see two or three renditions before you get to the point where folks have to make a final vote in January. Um, what we have been attempting to do over the last year or two, COVID has, has made it a little bit difficult, but typically, what I found is the best way to build a, a budget is from the bottom up. There are the overall kind of arching goals that the board has set, which is your ends. Um, those have been interpreted to critical ends that we kind of talked about um, at the last um, meeting that the principals are well aware of and have actually been working on for a year or two. And then this year, what we put into place was a, a revamped uh, evaluation process for teachers and one of the pieces of that evaluation process is that they develop goals that are based um, upon supporting the ends. And so it makes sense that if the teachers are doing this actual work and setting these goals that are going to help support the work that we need, that um, they are able to communicate upwards to us to say, hey, if you're asking us to do these goals, then we should be able to ask for the resources that we need to achieve them. And so that is the process that we've been slowly uh, moving to. I know the principals have been meeting with their respective faculties after they've done their goal setting. And so this budget is based around the information that came out and through that process. Um, a couple of things to be aware of is that things are very early right now in the budget season. And so not everything is complete. Uh, there is a lot of information out there that we are still waiting for from the state uh, before I can give you all the details. Um, Act 173 is a huge one. Um, Act 173 is changing how special education is funded. Um, it is going from what's called the reimbursement model. So pretty much every time we get a new kid in, regardless of when it is in the year, we can always be assured that 50 or 60% of the cost of that new student coming into the district is gonna be borne by the state. With this transition to what they call a census uh, block model, um, what that is going to do is they don't take a look at the number of special education students that we have so much, but they take a look at our overall population of students and say based upon that, and based upon a couple of waiting factors, we are going to give you a block sum of money at the start of the year to carry you through. 
And so that was one of the reasons we talked about a little earlier about the idea that we put a special education um, fund into place, uh, reserve fund, was because if we get that block of money at the beginning of the year, and we have what usually happens here, is we get three or four high need kids that move in in the middle of the year, um, sometimes costing anywhere from 100 to $300,000 per student. That could have a dramatic impact on the budget that we have to work with to do everything else that we do, um, that a budget does across the district. So this is a big unknown right now. They have given us a preliminary formula to use to try to um, calculate how much that we believe we will be receiving from the state when it turns to a, a census block grant. It seems to be about the same amount of money that we are spending right now. But the legislature last year went out um, and asked for the creation of what's called the waiting advisory. They have been looking through what they call the waiting. So if you're a district that has a whole bunch of students that are considered um, students of poverty, um, you get a little bit more money. If you're a district that has a high percentage of students that are um, on education plans, you get a little bit more money, recognizing that those students, to give them equitable services, are gonna be a little bit more expensive. And so this group is actually um, reporting out this week. And the scary part in terms of a budget is if they're reporting out this week and the legislature decides to change the formulas, those formulas probably won't be changed until after December and in, in January when we have to do our votes. Um, kind of like the situation we found ourselves in with healthcare um, a few years back. And so it's incredibly hard to predict what's going to happen. The law right now is that this census um, block grant has to go into place uh, in July. Um, the other piece that we don't have a good handle on, though we know it's to our benefit, is what they call average daily membership. This has to do with the number of students who actually live in our district who attend our schools. Uh, we get a certain amount of money out of the Ed Fund kind of per student. The more students we have, um, the more that we get from the Ed Fund. We'll talk a little bit about how much our population is up this year. Um, there will be a significant increase, at least on our revenue stream probably anywhere from a quarter to a half a million dollars because of our increase in enrollment. But we don't have the finalized numbers from the state at this point in time. And then the last piece that's the great unknown um, is we're back into that situation we were two years ago where the state is actually negotiating with the, the, the state level teachers union about health care changes. And so those negotiations have not gone well. I don't remember if they're in mediation right now or if they're through mediation and headed to arbitration. But again, the odds are we're not gonna hear the outcome um, of that arbitration until after you have probably voted on what the set budget is. And so these are the great unknowns as we're going into this for folks to be aware of. Um, most of what we're gonna talk about tonight is expenses because that's what we kind of have data for. What we don't have um, solid data on, which we just kind of talked about, is the revenue side, the money that we have coming in from different sources. So the big and the positive news is we've had significant increases in enrollment across the district. At the elementary level, we're in excess of 46 students. Um, in RUHS, it's seven students um, that are living in district, moved in district, um, and so they count in terms of the Ed Fund. But we also have a significant amount of revenue that is coming in from tuition students, students who choose to go here or paying tuition to go here, and that will be in excess of $300,000. Um, we've had, and uh, Felicia did a good job about talking about this, we've had a significant increase in enrollment at the Tech Center. Um, at least 40 students, it fluctuates up and down. Um, it was 160 the other day, which is huge. And so there are benefits. Again, it's the same thing. The more students you have, um, the more money um, that you have access to. Um, we've also had a significant increase in our enrollment in preschool as we have fully put the, the preschool model into place where we are offering free full day preschool to all four-year-olds across the district. Um, and then the other piece that needs to be considered in this um, that you're not gonna see in the calculations at the end because not all of this is solid yet, 
is that at the end of last year, we had that big surplus that we worked on, you know, knowing that we we're gonna to have to manage COVID for a while. We spent half of that surplus for this current year that we're in to help subsidize, take the burden off the taxpayers. We have half of that money left over um, and the agreement with the taxpayers was, hey, if you put it in this operational fund for us, we will take half of what is left over um, for next year's budget. And then that final half will go in the, the third year out. New expenses and things that we are looking at. Um, and again, this is not a final budget. This is, hey, these are our goals. These are the goals that you're set that are helping us out. What do you need? Um, and these are all the requests that have come back. So I call this the ends budget. This is like, hey, if you want us to do everything all at once, this is what you're looking at um, to, to get us moving in the right direction. So the first piece that's on there is that $65,000 um, for technology that's across the district. Um, there was a significant amount of training um, when we moved to remote session a year or so ago um, on probably about, I think it was 52 different software packages to help teachers at different levels and in different disciplines be able to connect with kids. Um, we are maintaining those right now, um, but a lot of that that first year was ESSER 1 um, money. Um, it is possible that we will be able to use ESSER 3 for it, but it is unclear. The teachers are still using it. We still don't know, even though hopefully, you know, we got shots going in little kids' arms um, in another week, that things are going to turn the corner, but we don't know for sure. Um, as it stands now, we have two or three classrooms a week um, that there's an outbreak in and uh, we're having to shut them down. Um, and so we still need access to, to the software. Um, the OSSD pre-K coordinator, we're looking for a point four. Uh, Pat Miller has been serving in this function. Um, again, you know, one of the pieces that is geared towards achievement of the ends and especially the foundational knowledge is that we realized early on, based upon the, the, the testing that we brought in, was that when the students were coming in to their first, the first grade that they enter our district, whether it's preschool, whether it's kindergarten, um, they are deficient in most of the skills that you see in students that are coming in um, at that level. And so we said, heck, um, that's something that's hurting them for years because they don't have those foundational skills under, the, under their belts. So we're gonna build this whole new grade um, for, for four-year-olds to make darn sure that by the time they hit kindergarten, they have those skills in place. And so this is kind of one of the last pieces of making sure we've got the personnel in place um, to keep the, that preschool uh, program going. Um, some of this has been in um, grant-funded positions up front. Um, we're trying to get the last couple of pieces out of the grant-funding positions because this is a permanent part of our district at this point. The other possibility is that with the new plan that may be coming down from the federal government, a lot of these costs may end up being covered because they're looking for expanding um, you know, uh, pre-K uh, nationwide. And so the hope is, is that there'll be some funding to help out a little bit with this. We are looking at potentially a website conversion the website that was put in um, the year prior to me coming um, was done um, through a single operator who had his own prior prioritized software, his own software creation um, that he created that website with. Shortly after the website was built, he said, I don't want to be a website person anymore. I'm going to go do construction in Florida. And so right after the website was built, we scrambled around. We found Ben Merrill, who has been awesome. Um, he learned uh, that proprietary software. He does all the work kind of updating it, but it's an expensive proposition to be, be um, handing that out. Um, what we're looking at is potentially bringing the website in-house, um, having somebody here who can physically do that, and that's the reason you see the tech support specialist under there. We want to bring the website in, um, change the software to be something simpler that's a little bit more open that pretty much anybody can use um, and then uh, bring in a tech support specialist who can do two things one maintain the website for us on the fly um, and two if he has additional time on his hands he can help support or she can help support the uh, our, our tech team here we have three tech people that manage 
across all the schools in the district and every kid has a one-to-one -one computer and we just talked about the 52 new software packages that came on board they are overwhelmed um, and so it's it's appropriate to try to, to bring that in um, as part of the superintendent's report um, we talked about this the other day um, a little bit I went out and I did the research in terms of what the other districts have and I looked at districts that were our size uh, we're about 1100 if you include RTCC um, and smaller and so when I did that analysis there are three positions that are required by statute by mandate superintendent your business manager and your special education director so those were not included in the count because all districts have to have them the only thing that I counted was people above and beyond those positions and I believe it was 2.7 um, on average and those were districts that were even half our size 2.7 additional people in central office which explains why I'm so tired and burnt out um, in most cases uh, what they had was a human resources manager we have over 200 employees here um, and in addition to the human resource manager they also had a curriculum Curriculum director would be vitally important. Um, I've, I've cobbled together kind of a curriculum director with a few people um, because they drive the work on curriculum in the ends. Right? So without them, we don't quite have the structure to really push ourselves where we need to go. Human resources is the other piece. Um, that is a full-time job. It's even more so now with all the stress um, that's happening in and around COVID. And it's so filled with layers of laws and, and, and nuances in the law that you really need to have somebody who specialized in it. I've been fulfilling that role as best I can. I've got more experience in it than most, most folks, but I do spend a lot of time talking with the lawyers for the things that I don't know, um, which, which racks up bills. I do not think, um, and nor do I want to shift money away um, even though I think it's vitally important um, from the teachers and from the kids um, yes this would help in the end but the teachers are hurting right now and I know that um, so rather than looking for two people I would make an argument for an assistant superintendent where you will have two moderately overworked people instead of one incredibly overworked um, person they typically do things like they 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 manage all the grants which are significant right now um, the reason they manage the grants is because they're also in charge of, of curriculum across the district K to 12 and usually the grant money is used to improve instruction and academics and so since they've got the knowledge of what they're attempting to accomplish in terms of academics in our in our case towards the ends with that knowledge they can now use the grants and use them and tailor them specifically to those needs we do a pretty good job but it's piecemeal because this work is spread out amongst three of us at this point in time uh, the other thing that they could do that I think would, is going to be very important uh, would be to oversee the early education the preschool Pat did a really good job of getting the thing built and there's still some more construction to do on it um, but at some point in time after that major work is done um, the work requirements are going to be decreased and this is something that, that an assistant superintendent um, could handle the other reason that this is important um, is because of your executive limitations for succession planning given everything that is going on with COVID and all the massive work that's across the district above and beyond the norm including the the the, the testing the the contact tracing um, the vaccination clinics that we're planning all those other parts and pieces if I drop dead tomorrow you're going to be hurting um, and that's we need somebody in there who's got their hands on things so that I can take a sick day whether folks realize it or not when we did the last meeting I had been throwing up all day long and it was only the medicine that got me through the meeting for the ends presentation and it's not a complaint the work needs to be done I don't mind doing it last year when we had the first MOU meeting with the union two hours prior to that I shattered my ankle because no one else was going to be able to step in that meeting and run it the way that it needed to be run especially 
with making sure that all the nuance was there, I was at that meeting and I sat for four hours in excruciating pain before I could go to the emergency room. So again, it's not a complaint. Stuff has to be done and happy to do it, but there has been a real impact um, in, in, in terms of, of the work that's going on, on here. And I think it's in the best interest of, of the district to have somebody who can step in at a moment's notice if needed um, to take things over. Um, and you guys, questions anytime um, along the way. Um, otherwise, you're just going to hear me rambling the whole time. Oops. Braintree. Um, in talking with Braintree, they're looking at a few folks. Um, and we'll go through the reason why and try to tie them back to the end. So there's the social worker, a, a half-time social worker, increasing the, the library media specialist that's there from one day a week to two days a week. They're looking for a building-wide para, and they're looking for additional supplies to support um, a lot of the new programming that's up there right now. Um, the social worker. Whether folks uh, realize it or not, we are seeing new behaviors in, in children, both young and old, that we have never seen before. So this is far afield from the trauma discussions that we had in previous years. Um, they are coming in, um, they blow out with temper tantrums. Um, you ask them to do simple things that um, they may not want to do, but they're small, and it's an immediate breakdown into tears. It's a reaction to the stress of the world right now. It's a reaction to what they see the adults in their lives doing, both locally in the home, on TV, um, and it's playing out in the schools. And so, at least for a little while, assuming the mechanisms in the outside world that are causing this ever calm down, we do need additional help above and beyond um, to try to mitigate these behaviors in the students so that they can actually learn. How does it support the ends? If they're dysregulated, if they're crying, if they're bursting, bursting out all the time, if they're having a temper tantrum and it takes a half hour to get them calmed down, we cannot teach them. And so we, we need that support. In terms of the library and the media specialists um, at the elementary school, um, things are a little bit different than at the high school. At the high school, there's a seven period day. They typically teach four or five classes. So they have a lot of open spots in the schedule through the week to do their planning, um, to connect with the department, uh, to do a lot of the work above and beyond the classroom that teachers normally do. At the elementary level, it's a different story. Um, they are with those kids almost all day long. The only kind of breaks they get are usually their lunch. Um, and they usually uh, have a break um, for planning or team meetings uh, when the kids have a special, right? They go off to music for a little while. Having the library media specialist there will do two things. Um, the first thing is it's going to allow for a little bit more time for those teachers to connect. Um, to do the work that they need to do with all the initiatives that we have in math and science and ELA. Um, give them a little bit more planning time. And the library media specialist actually delivers a digital literacy curriculum, which originally was going to be one of the pieces that went into the technology end that, that the board had. And so it will, will help enhance that a little bit. Um, the building-wide paras are important. Um, a lot of this is for equity. Um, they are a body that exists in the other buildings, um, but not in the two small schools. They do everything. They take a lot of the more mundane tasks off the hands of the teachers so the teachers can focus more intently on the teaching and learning with the kids. Um, the other thing that they do is everybody has heard about the sub piece, that there's not enough subs to go around. Um, they can step in uh, on a day if they can't get a sub for a classroom and they can do that um, for the day. And then again, the additional supplies is that to help out a lot, you know, like the, the math program that we brought in, the science program that we brought in to help support that. Um, Brookfield is very similar. It's got the same, same asks um, with one exception, um, and that's pre-K, um, right? We have uh, a, a preschool at all the schools right now. Um, to keep the one maintained up there, we need that 0.5 um, to keep the preschool physically at, uh, at Brookfield. It's up there. That 0.5 is currently being paid out of the grants. Um, so that's a part of that four-year-old 
Old Day Preschool for folks. Uh, Randolph Elementary, um, we talked about, yeah, we got 46, 46 new, new kids at the elementary level. Most of them got concentrated in Randolph Elementary. They're going to need a new classroom teacher. Um, you get, get an increase, increase in students like that. It cannot be absorbed into the existing classrooms. Again, they are looking at a behavioral specialist uh, for those behaviors that we talked about. Those new ones that are showing up that seem to be a response to, to COVID in the country right now. And uh, they are looking for a building pair to serve that same need. Do a lot of the mundane tasks to serve as kind of a permanent um, person who's there that can be pulled as a sub, uh, you know, when, when we need one. Randolph Union High School, um, and this is one that may be refined a little bit. Uh, we have uh, always been a little bit short in terms of, of nursing staff, and obviously with COVID, this is critical at this point in time. Um, so they are looking at increasing um, their nursing staff a, a, half, a half a person and that person would be shared between the tech center and the high school. Um, the other thing that they're looking at is the, a new math teacher. Um, again, keep the numbers down in the classroom so that the instruction is, is more efficient. Um, the high school has done a very good job at keeping a, a wide diversity of programming for students, but with that, what you happen is we have a lot of electives that may have eight or nine kids in a class. Um, and you know, rather than cut those electives to create a math teacher position, we'd rather preserve those electives because those programs draw students. Um, but we've got a lot of kids in our math classes in a lot of cases, you know, while, while the electives may have nine or 10 kids, a lot of our core classes have 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. And so this will help actually reduce um, the number of students that's in the math classes at the high school. There is also the whole other side uh, of uh, the coin. So everything that we've talked about so far are, are kind of discretionary spending. Yeah, if we want to do a lot of the work that, that we're trying to accomplish on the ends, this is kind of what we need to do that, but we don't have to. It's a choice. There is spending that happens every year that, that is, is contractual, it's mandatory. We went into negotiations with the teachers and the teachers are going to be getting a 4.5% uh, increase to salary next year. We signed a contract on that, we have to honor it. Um, and so that piece is a, a part of this budget. The paraprofessional salary was 4.5%. Um, this one is a little bit different, and let's see if I can explain this without a lot of graphics up there. You have folks like the principals, the directors, and the confidential secretaries, not me. It's a separate group from me that um, every year for the past couple of years, I've always budgeted 3% for them. Well, every year for the past couple of years, the teachers have gotten more than that. And to put them in parity um, next year with all the additional um, pieces that the teachers have gotten, right, to keep that, that, that separation there for them, um, they would need a 4.9% increase to get them up in parity with the teachers. Um, the bus driver salary, um, there's going to be a salary increase. We don't know what it is. Their contract is currently open for negotiations. We'll talk a little bit about that in, exec in executive session. This is something that, um, you know, the board has to decide. Is this something the board wants to negotiate or is this something the board wants to delegate uh, to the, the superintendent or another body or a subcommittee uh, to negotiate on their behalf? And then in what was probably the most surprising thing about the budget overall is this is the first time in my life I have not seen a double digit increase for the cost of the health insurance that we provide teachers. So there might be an increase in, in health costs depending upon the negotiated of who pay, who's paying how much of the health insurance. We're still waiting on that. But in terms of just the overall cost of health insurance, it's going up by 5.2% uh, next year. It's usually double digits. It's usually in the 11 to 14%. How do you know that if you don't know how much it's going to be? So the insurance, got, so, so for a family plan right now, it's $25,000. So what the insurance company is, is saying is for that family plan for next year, you can plan on paying 5.2% more for it. 
The difference with the teacher negotiation piece with the state is, okay, of that 25,000, right now we're paying 80%, they're paying 20. It might come back that next year we're, we're, they're, they're, they're paying 15% and we're paying whatever that difference is, right? So two different costs there, right? One is just the overall, you know, what's, what's, what's inflation in terms of health insurance? The other is who's paying what percentage of the health insurance? If we end up paying a higher percentage of it, that's going to have a potentially significant cost. So, good question. So, bottom line expenses, um, and again, this is the ends budget. This is not expected to be the final. This is these are the goals, people. What do you need to help us reach it? Okay. This is everything people said that they they, they needed to reach it. So, this year's budget um, right now is twenty million uh, one seventy one. All those additional pieces that we just talked about is just about a million bucks. Um, so that would put the budget for uh, next year, 2022-23, um, at 21,176. It would be a 4.98% increase. Now, a lot of caveats here. Remember, we've just looked at expenses. There are significant additional revenues that would offset some of this. We don't know what those are yet. The state does not have to give us the formulas or the other information we need until December 15th, which is usually when they give it to us. So, you know, if you were to ask me right now, um, you know, you're, you're looking at a million dollars in expenses, how much is going to be offset by revenue? I can tell you right off the bat, I know 300,000 of that's going to be offset by revenue. I also know another 412,000 of that's going to be offset because of the, the subsidies that we put there. I also know that we've got another quarter million to half a million that we're probably going to get for ADM. I can't be sure until the state tells us, but my guess is, is that all those other increases are going to probably compensate for most of this. My guess is, is that you're probably looking at a budget increase of after that revenue. It's definitely less than 3%. It's probably in the two-ish range. Um, but again, we have to wait for that. So it's, it's hard to do this budget this early because you can only look at expenses, so it's easy to freak people out. Um, but it's not, it, it's not what it appears to be, um, if that makes sense. And so that's kind of where we are in the process at this time, if there's questions. Did yeah. I make any sense at all? I did. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. well, I was going to say thank you for the presentation, and yeah. I, I really appreciate your kind of explanation behind everything because it made it very tangible. Um, are there ways, and this came up to me just now, are there ways to get these um, when you're doing these PowerPoints? Can you send these to us oh, after? Yeah. Because I just feel like yeah, there, it's here, and it's really helpful sometimes to be able to go yeah. over it again. I don't know, sometimes, sometimes because it's summarizing stuff, it may not be as meaningful, but I'm happy to. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so it, uh, either either before we leave leave tonight or tomorrow morning, I'll shoot it off. That's yeah. appreciated. Thank you. Yeah. Usually, actually, Orca usually asks for them after the fact, and they they, they put them up on the oh. the site too, so it's good. But yeah. All right. Um, and again, like I said, the, the the biggest message right now is there's there's just there's a lot that's unknown. Are there any other questions or comments about the budget? Lynn, I don't I have a question about the financial statement, didn't we? Uh, sure, that's that comes after the budget. That comes yeah. after yeah, that, that comes up toward the end. And depending upon how specific it is, I might be able to answer it. The, if it's more than that, then we get Robin in here. I think you're gonna be able to answer it. Do you, don't, do, do people mind if we jump ahead to the monthly financial report? I can know. wait. It's fine. Or you can wait. Yeah. Okay. Um, so anything related to the projected budget for 22 and 23? Um, awesome. Okay. So uh, how about um, the COVID operating plan? Oh, yeah. We can go that. Sorry about that. Um, and again, you, you sort of you emailed us the sort of the protocols for what was emailed out to the community and we heard um, we heard Matt yeah. 
take on what was sent out? So the so there's two things. So there's there's the updates that happened on um, I think it was 1025 um, that went out, and a lot of that um, actually was was quite helpful to us. A lot of that was changing the process for contact tracing. And so that was the last major update that was sent out to folks. Um, let me go, kind of go through the bullets here because there were a lot of little pieces and I don't want to miss any here. Um, doo -doo -doo. Uh, so the, the big thing right now is that rather than having our, our poor um, nurses calling all the close contacts individually, uh, what it allowed us to do is instead we mail, email out a quarantine letter when we've identified who the close contacts are. And then we also follow it up with a robocall to those folks and say, hey, look at your email. And so that kind of directs them in terms of what, what they need to do to kind of follow up. And it's taken a lot of burden off. Um, most of the folks that they call in these situations are, are nice. Some are not so nice, and I'll leave it at that. Um, and so I'm quite happy to be able to separate them from that, um, having to deal with some of that angst. Um, the state did change the definition of what a close contact was when it came to the students. Um, you know, it was used to be if you were within uh, within six feet, um, you know, for your 15 minutes over a 24 hour period, you were a close contact. Um, they changed it to three um, for students. It remains the same. Six feet remains the same, though, for the adults in the building. Um, we no longer need to contact trace for exposures that occurred outside. Um, on the buses, which was always a tough time, even though we've got very good seating charts. Um, we only need to contact trace the students that were sitting in the seat next to the, the, the positive student, um, if it's a student that was positive. Um, the governor, we kind of talked a little bit about this that, that Matt had brought up, um, and this is the next big change that will be coming of the specific protocols um, for winter sports. The governor kind of pretty much um, left it up to the individual districts. Um, the second the superintendents heard that because we heard about it at the same time everybody else did which is when the governor made the announcement we said you know what it's probably wiser for all of us to get together and just do the same thing so we are doing exactly the same as all the other um, groups in the Winooski Valley League of which we are a part um, the basic gist is is that yes we do want people um, to be able to come in and be spectators but you got to follow the rules um, in terms of the masks in peace, and, and I have to be very clear about this, because arguments over getting people to wear masks can be extremely contentious and even violent, I will not put any of my staff in a role that might result in violence because they're asking somebody to wear a mask. So in other words, yep, they'll go up if somebody's not doing what they need to do. Hey, put the mask on. But the second an argument erupts about it, we back off, and that's when we start to look at restricting who can come to our games. It's a, it's a tough environment. It's potentially a, 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 a dangerous environment, especially if folks have been watching what's been happening on the airplanes. Uh, and so I worry a lot about that. I have also um, told... Um, ben, you know, one of the protocols will be, and we're going to have to spend a little bit of extra money on it, we will have police officers at every event um, to, 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 to mitigate against that. The hope is everybody behaves and things are good, but I have a real worry, and hopefully it's unfounded, um, that, you know, folks will show up not wanting to wear a mask, and, and I do not want my staff, they are not equipped to deal with that, that, that sort of a, an outburst or not. Um, concessions, um, we talked a little bit about it. It really can't happen in the building because folks have to take the masks off to eat. We said, yeah, they could probably do it outside, but we're not sure how easy it's going to be able to police to keep people from bringing it inside. Um, and so the, that's kind of the basic gist of what the protocols will, will end up being. Um, i trying to think. I don't know if there's other questions on it that might be sparking things that aren't in my head now, but I'm happy to answer them. Based on what I know. So remember, folks, the reason we're asking for these updates is just to understand his rationale and what he's using to make these decisions. This is so. the superintendents all got together. This is what, what we're, we're, we're pulling up. There's still a, a couple of like the fine details and the messaging piece of it is is is, is, is still being worked on, but that'll be out shortly. 
So my guess is, is hopefully by Monday or Tuesday, you know, I'm updating the COVID uh, handbook with, with, with those, those final processes and procedures. So. So, so is there any talk on limiting the actual numbers in the gym? There is no uh, limit. That, that, or is it, if everyone wears a mask, we're gonna if, if folks are wearing masks and try, trying to keep it apart, one, one of the pieces of logic that I, I tried to express about that for some folks that were a little concerned about it is this is high school sports. Our liability is reduced because most of those folks are old enough to get a vaccine. If you didn't get the vaccine and you get sick at one of our events, that's going to be kind of hard to, for them to, to come after us for. Uh, the thing that we might do, and this is one of the things that's still up in discussion, is while we're under no real obligation to contact trace in a venue like that where we've got folks that are coming in and out, what we might do is set up sections to say this is the blue section, this is the green section, this is the yellow section. Please remember the section you're in because what we could do is if we find out that there's been an exposure, we could say send out that letter or send out a communication to say, hey, if you were sitting in the yellow section, you may be exposed. These are things that you may want to do. Um, so that's you know one of the kind of final pieces we're, 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 we're picking around. But the big thing is just, you know, wear, wear the mask and have a good time. Okay. That's, that's the goal. So, uh, and that's, that's most of it. In terms of other COVID um, pieces, uh, Gifford's been great. They, they reached out about trying to set up a clinic um, here. Um, Beth and um, Erica were having a good discussion um, with me today about it. Um, the logistics may be a little bit tough, uh, but we're going to try to make that work. Um, if not, then we will invite the state in to do uh, a vaccination on site. The state will come in, I think, but I don't think they're coming in until uh, like mid December ish. Um, the, it's just the logistics on the, on the other may be a, a little bit, a little bit tough. Plus, I've got people that are just so overworked because we've had so many cases lately. Um, they're, 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 they're going off the walls. Um, the test to stay protocols were also in the the previous. Um, round uh, we are geared up for that um, we finally did get the consent uh, letters uh, we've got the software that's required to enter the data into um, the and I don't blame the staff they handed that off to me today because for whatever reason you have to prove your identity so you have to give them a significant amount of personal information and financial information for them to be able to identify who you are um, entering this portal where you know the medical information is going in and that made them feel uncomfortable so I'll, I'll be putting in my information into that tomorrow to get that up and running um, the test to stay could start immediately um, after that's done um, the problem with it however is the fact that uh, test to stay is kind of like close con uh, con contact tracing it's awesome if you only have a few cases and it's really effective and you got a lot of cases, it may not work. And right now we've got a lot of cases. Um, and so we're going to try to make it work um, with the, 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 the case numbers that we have. Um, but people just need to be aware if we call up and say, hey, we're not doing um, tests to stay, it's because we've got too many um, students to be able to do um, each morning. Um, hopefully that's a rare event, uh, we'll see. Have you looked into tapping into the medical corps, the state medical corps, or volunteers? To help with, like medical volunteers to help with some of the uh, they, they have it's difficult um, folks folks are tapped out um, you know we had we have a nurse who's leaving um, and we're trying to find a replacement for the nurse um, and it's it, it's incredibly hard we did luck out find a, a wonderful lady who was a medical um, assistant um, in the medical office um, who has all the skills that are needed who's going to be floating around between the buildings or the Test to stay um, pieces going on and trying to help out with that. Um, so I think we're we're okay. A lot of it is um, I don't know if you've seen those tests, the the rapid ones. It's uh, it's paper chromatography that they're using. Um, so basically, you know, you you put the antigen and the testing agent on the paper. It slowly works its way up, and because different chemicals are attracted to the paper at different uh, by different amounts, it separates them out. There's a, a very exact time that you actually have to look to read the test. There's a three-minute window 
right? And if you're if you're too early or you're too late, you're going to misread the test. Um, so you know if you got and it takes 15 minutes to let the thing run. So if you screw up the timing because you got 20 kids standing there, it's a nightmare. You know you got five or six kids, awesome. You know you get 20, 30, 40, 50 kids. It may not be doable, so we'll we'll figure it out as best we can. Um, we got a great great group of people that are working on it. So but I think that's that's all of the updates. I haven't seen much that's new today. <laughs> Keeping my fingers crossed because they tend to come in every day. So I don't know if there, any questions on anything. I'm happy to answer. Do you have any numbers on you know preliminary numbers about? getting the kids up to that 80 percent vaccination so uh I yeah the, I, I actually i can actually even pull them up for you so elementary um they haven't started yet right. so we've got like two kids vaccinated in one school one kid vaccinated mm -hmm. in another um and i think the the reason being is they probably had some underlying medical condition that made them eligible um, the staff rates are ranging anywhere between 76 and 95 percent, depending upon the school that you're in. In RUHS, uh, I think the student rate, and please don't quote me on it, it's in the low to mid 70s. Um, recognize that the guidance from the state has changed on that in terms of taking the masks off every month. They push it out another month. Right. Yeah, I know it's in the January yeah. right now. Yeah, so that, that's uh, before that the, be pushed the, off. the hope is, and that's why I was pick, picking February, you know, saying that, you know, things are probably going to get a little bit tougher before they get better. The hope is, is that if shots start going into arms and, and people are supportive of that, you know, that might be a good turning point um, at that point in time. Uh, you know, we might see some, some real improvements, you know, by February. Uh, I'm keeping my fingers crossed for everybody's sake. Are there any other questions? Um, okay, we'll move along now to the financial report. Okay. So, I, mean, I just have a question. Um, I'm curious why fiscal year, uh, October year to date is less this year than last year. Because I'm assuming expenses went up. Is it reflective of fewer staff? Are you on revenues? On, are you on? I am on the Orange Southwest School District. It's the first page of the financial report. Yep. And I'm looking at expenditures. And under instruction for October 2020, it was 1.6 million, but October 2021 is 1.3. Yeah. And is that, I was curious if that's a reflection of less staff? It is probably a number of things. Um, we had quite a few folks that were high on the pay scale that retired. Okay. And again, when we're building a budget, we build it based upon what we currently have at the time. And a lot of the staff that, were, that came in were lower on the pay scale. So it's not a reduction in staff, but it's potentially, if you were to ask me without having Robin look into greater detail, it was probably a reduction um, based upon the fact they're lower on the pay scale. Okay, not paying them as much, so you're not going to hit as much sure. at this point in time. Because almost every area on here is less. Yeah. Okay. There is also, we did what we could. One of the things that we were asked to do um, with the ESSER funding is to try to use it to cover as much of regular expenses that fit under ESSER okay. as possible, because that's helping them out with the Ed Fund. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Good question. Questions on the financial report? Anything that we should be concerned about, Wayne? No, actually, the the one the one that usually comes up over the course of the year, I was talking with Robin about it today, is the um, the food service, um, right? You know, the goal is is that when you have a food service come in, is that they at least break even. Uh, we have always subsidized. Um, usually, I think it's to the tune of about thirty thousand dollars or so. To cover it and usually they're still still in the hole um, a bit and that's just that's how food service works with uh, things the way they are right now with the federal government doing reimbursements pretty much for every kid uh, they are actually paying us four dollars a lunch and so they are actually in the best shape they have ever been um, in terms of in terms of food service right now 
that was the only only quirk that, that kind of jumped out at folks kind of looking through the financials. Any other questions? If not, we'll continue on. Um, uh, we were looking at, uh, oh, so this may be, again, something that um, we want to wait until after the review of our policies, but uh, we were looking again at our board governance policy um, when we had had our training in July we were we had questions about who our owners were and so we we were wondering if um, we wanted to take a look at uh, 4.0 which is the policy where we talk about who our owners are and and if we want to clarify more or not um, who our owners are. Can I move to table this discussion until further meeting because we are quite behind on our agenda. Sure. Do we have a second for that motion? Second. Second. Seconded by Brian. So we'll um, table this discussion to the next meeting. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, oh, sorry. It's okay. <laughs> it's getting late. Um, so, do we have any discussion about tabling? Are we all, uh, or, so I'm going to call the motion. Um, are we all in favor of tabling the discussion on who our owners are until the next meeting? Yes. You say aye. 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 Okay. Passes. Okay, so we're on to the next, which is again reviewing those policies. Um, and this we may also, I don't know if folks feel like they want to table that as well until after I contact this is them. The required, right? This is the AOB required policy. Oh, oh. Yep. Right. We have the first one is, is um, looking at the first review of the required policy. Thank you, Katya, for catching me. I was moving on to the second. <laughs> um, so that was the policy that's in our, our packet. And these are required policies um, by the state and Lane. Lane, do you want to speak about? Yeah, this, um, I try, I, Part of it is trying to figure out why you know they're making this a policy. Um, basically, what it's saying is that we are we agree as a district, um, you agree as a board, to make sure that we are following the and the special education um, protocols that are set down in the AOE's um, special education manual. My guess is, and this is true, every district has to pass. It's not just us. Um, my guess is is that because they receive significant federal monies, this is probably a requirement placed on them by the feds. And so they will, from this, um, they would develop the guidelines. That, that manual does not yet exist as far as we know. We were looking for it the other day. It's in development. Um, and so, uh, you know, once that comes on board, we follow the, that, that guidance, um, which even without the policy, we would do. Makes a little bit of sense. Okay. So next was the um, the uh, looking at whether or not we want to make any changes to our uh, EL policy 2.1 and 2.2 treatment of uh, students parents and community and the 2.2 .2 treatment of staff so and that was the one that I'm, saying I'm going to make a motion to, to table that one as well until you've discussed so you've had a chance to reach out to the BSBA regarding policy review in general I second any discussion on that all those in favor aye, aye. 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 
And then next up, it was um, to talk a little bit about the report. Oh, no, it was to report on the VSBA. So as um, board members, um, when the VSBA meeting was tonight, so I wasn't able to attend, um, and the regional meeting was on our other board meeting night. So um, no one was able to attend that. Um, so there's nothing to report out. Um, however, I wanted to um, make sure folks were aware and you should have gotten a, an email um, from the VSBA <coughs> as uh, OSIDE board members when uh, we registered for the VSBA conference, um, they you pay as a district. So that's why if uh, hopefully you've seen in your email from the VSBA, um, you have access to the conference. It's it, well, it started tonight, so they just had a speaker tonight. But they were recording it, so. I would imagine you have access to that <coughs> somewhere if you wanted to um, take a look at it. And then tomorrow they have a speaker in the morning, but at noon, and I don't know if people have lunch hour time that they want to do uh, school board stuff, but there is going to be a session on, on this waiting, um, the, the waiting study and kind of where that is in terms of special ed, which is going to impact um, our budgeting. There's also going to be one on school governance. And again, if folks, you know, we've been doing a lot about looking at how we're governing ourselves, what our policies say, um, how is this working for us? So it might be um, something that you want to look at. And again, I'm, I'm hoping that maybe they'll record things. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, because the district paid for us to um, participate, um, since most people are having to work, um, we may be able to see recordings of these sessions. So um, hang on to that email and, and uh, you know, if you want to go back and listen to um, some of the sessions that you know, hopefully that will um, They'll be recording everything, including the workshop. Um, so I just wanted to make sure people were aware of that. Any questions? Uh, consent agenda. We need to approve uh, the minutes. Um, and then um, the other thing on the consent agenda, Lane has already spoken to us about. Do people remember that is the um, approval of the um, using the transportation reserve funds and the uh, facilities reserve funds for uh, for building the outdoor classroom and for buying um, the trucks for the district. Are we ready to move the consent agenda as a whole? I make a motion we approve the consent agenda as presented. I'll second. Second. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Good to go. Okay, any questions about the superintendent's report or the principal's reports? Anything you want to, that you haven't already told us, Lane, <laughs> that you want to know from that? Yeah, not unless there's questions. Okay, so um, we are going, well, I have the task of reaching out to the VSBA for uh, someone to help us review our policy governance policies and to get them to engage with us if they do. Um, and then uh, we are going to revisit 
a discussion on who our owners are and we'll wait on that other the, the review of those other policies mm -hmm. if we get somebody who's, who's going to review our whole set of policies <laughs> um, did i miss anything okay anybody have anything that's that they're dying to have on the agenda for next time Seeing nothing, I will adjourn the meeting at 8.34, and we're going to go into executive session for uh, to discuss negotiations and uh, personnel matters.